Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, an Oklahoma rancher and farmer. Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for over 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say, time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody back, and uh, I trust that those of you out on television realize that after each one of these half-hour programs, we give them a coffee break, and uh, so that's what I mean when we get them back. It's not always that easy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we've even got a couple here from Minnesota today, and uh, I forgot to mention that the first couple times. And uh, my, we've had visitors uh, out at the ranch from Indiana and uh, where else? Iowa. Oh, every day lately we've had somebody stop by. And uh, so we enjoy that. So those of you out on television, if you're ever coming through the tr tremendous <coughs> metropolis of Kenta, Oklahoma, you look us up. <laughs> and uh, you might as well do like everybody else does. They go to the post office and, and they ask our postmaster where we are and he directs them and uh, they all find us. So uh, anyhow, those of you out there, we uh, appreciate you so much. We appreciate your financial help, your prayers, and your letters. My, how we live for those letters. And uh, it's taking a little bigger chunk out of our day all the time, but uh, we still uh, can read every letter and uh, open every one. And we do appreciate that so much, more than words can tell. And of course, uh, remember, all our programs are available on the print and the video and the audio. And if you're ever interested in those, a lot of folks are using them for home Bible studies, and that thrills us. Because uh, I don't care how good a pastor is, I don't care how good a Sunday school, you just can't get enough uh, in just one or two hours a week. You have to have some study at home. And uh, it's just part and parcel of the Christian experience to share it with others. And so we have folks all over the country using our videotapes for a home Bible study. And uh, then I always give them the option, if you run up against a question that you can't answer, why well, we got the 800 number, you call, and uh, hopefully I can help you over some of those humps. Okay, now for those of you here in the studio, as well as those of you out in television, let's look at the next verse in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Now here the Apostle Paul is going to utter a prayer on behalf of the believer. He is praying for them, and as he does so, he is praying for us today. And I think it's also a lesson in how we can pray for ourselves as well as for others. And uh, now as we think of the Lord's Prayer back in Matthew, which the Lord Jesus gave as an example to the twelve, so this prayer is an example for us. And uh, it is so appropriate. All right, verse 15, wherefore? Now, what have I told you over the years? Whenever Paul says, wherefore, what's he reflecting on? Well, what he's just said. And here he has just proven that here we are positioned in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who will lead us and reprove us and all the things that we need. And we're waiting for the day of redemption when this old body will disappear and we'll have a new body. Okay, but in the interim, until that day of redemption, wherefore, he says... I also, after I heard of your, what? Faith. Now, I, I want to make people aware constantly, whenever you read Paul's letters, how he is always referring to believing and faith. That, that's the core. Not what we can do, but that we trust in what God has already done. And then, on that basis, we can move into what he's now asking for on our behalf. Now he says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints. Now that reminds me of a verse. Can't help it. Honey, let's go back to 1 John. 1 John again, where we were in an earlier program this afternoon. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 3. Oh, let's just start at verse 11, because I, I don't like to just jump on one verse. I think most of you know that by now. But 1 John chapter 3, and let's just start at verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should, what? Love one another. 
not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore did he kill him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Boy, now that's plain language, isn't it? And it's never changed. The unbelieving world hates the believer. Oh, he may not always show it, but he would if he had a chance. And so Cain, of course, had his chance and he showed it. Now verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now don't be surprised. Don't, don't think that, you know, I think a lot of us get the idea that since Christianity is such a tremendous experience, it's such a tremendous lifestyle. Hey, listen, there isn't another lifestyle on earth that can come close to it. You look at a good Bible-based Christian home, hey, you couldn't ask for anything better. Well, see, the world can't see it that way. The world thinks we're a bunch of kooks and we got our head in the sand and all these other things. So don't, don't be amazed if, if they don't, don't like your lifestyle. So he says, marvel not at that. Now verse 14 is the verse I was thinking of. We know that we have passed from death unto life, in other words, from an unsaved state to a saved state, because we, what? Love what people? The brethren, fellow believers, see? The world won't necessarily. But we have that affinity to other believers that no matter where we go, we can have a love for them. And it's immediate. You know, I've shared this on the program before. Wherever we travel, wherever we spend the night with, with believers, you're not strangers five minutes. Why? Because there's that affinity. You can't see it, you can't put your finger on it, but it's there. And the moment we sit down at their kitchen table instead of ours, you know, I'm getting people to write now, I said, boy, I wish I could sit down at your kitchen table. Well, so do I. But uh, the minute we get into home and go in and have a cup of coffee and sit at their table, Hey, you don't talk about sports or the weather or politics. What do we talk about? The book, see? Immediately. That's all people can talk about. Well, that's as it should be, because we know we have passed from death unto life when we have that affinity, that common ground with fellow believers. All right, coming back then to Ephesians. So he says that he has heard of their love for the fellow believers. Now then, verse 16 of Ephesians 1 again. The apostle writes, I see, sir, I never stop giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now here's his real prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit, the pneuma again, that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of him. Now what's the purpose? Well, you see, the more we love him, the more capable we are of serving him. And it's the same way in, in a marriage relationship. The more that husband and wife love each other, the better influence they're going to have on family and relatives and everybody else. It, it, it's, it spread, see? All right, now the same way here. Paul prays that we might have such a God-given wisdom and knowledge. Now, I've learned from my class people here in Oklahoma, they've shared it with me more than once, that they were always afraid to share the gospel with people because they just didn't have enough knowledge of the scripture to be able to answer questions or confront rebuke and so forth. But after they've been in our class for a while and get skilled in the scriptures, they love to witness. They love to talk about the scriptures. Well, this is part and parcel of it, that as we grow in grace and knowledge, it becomes easier to share the, in fact, maybe I put it on the program before, I don't know, but you talk to a person in any kind of, a, of an occupation, I, I always like to use the example of an auto mechanic. You, you talk to an auto mechanic about engines and cars and so forth, is he bashful? Is he shy? Is he going to put his head down and, and act as though he doesn't want to talk? Oh, heavens no, you're in his bailiwick now and he's ready to tell you everything he knows, see? Well, 
you talk to an MD and you start talking about medical things, does he back off as if to say, well, I don't want to talk to you about that? No, he loves to share his knowledge. That's as it should be. Well, now this is what we have to be with the book. We have to be so skilled in our knowledge of it that we don't have to back away when someone comes up with a question or a rebuke. We can say, but look, this is what the book says. And that's my best argument. This is what the book says. Then what I think, then what my denomination says, it's what does the Word of God say. And all right, this is what Paul is praying, even for these early believers, that their wisdom and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ might be so great. And then verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now listen, that takes time. I mean, the moment we're saved, we don't have a full knowledge of all these things. It's a growth process. In fact, that's the whole idea of the early chapters of Romans, and we call it those three chapters on sanctification. Now, you want to remember that at salvation, yes, we're sanctified, we're set apart. But in our experience, every day is a process of sanctification. It's a continuous growth in our Christian experience and in our knowledge of the Scriptures, and that comes, of course, with some effort on our part. We have to put something into it. Now, that doesn't add to our salvation. That's complete. But if we want to really gain the knowledge and the wisdom of God, now we got to put some feet to it. And we have to put some time into the Word. You know, this is another thing that, that just thrills Iris and I. Letter after letter comes in. That for the first time in their life, although they've been Christians for 50 years, for the first time in their life, they are studying their Bibles. Well, listen, nothing could thrill us more because this is what we want people to do. Not listen to what I say. But get into the Word, and once you understand this graphic difference between law and grace, between Peter's preaching and Paul's preaching, and you can separate those two, my land, it just gets so exciting. It all fits, see? There's no more contradiction. There's no more, what shall I say? Uh, I say this reverently, no more gobbledygook to it. It's not confusion. It is all laid out so perfectly but you have to learn to discern these things. All right, so that's all part of what Paul talks about, that your eyes, your understanding, being enlightened or opened up, and that you may, what's the next word? No. See, you don't go through this life groping and wondering and hoping. No, you're knowing what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Now again, I dare say we could ask the average believer, what's in store for you after this life? Well, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Well, that's great. That's nice to know. Is that all you can tell me? Well, for most of them. Well, is there more? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's more. It's not enough to know that we're going to go to heaven when we die. That's all well and good. But listen, God wants us to get at least as much as he has revealed of what's out there. I mean, it's just not an empty darkness. God is getting something fantastic ready for us. And there's a lot it doesn't tell us. But on the other hand, we've already looked at some of the prospects. We're going to have a glorified body like Christ's resurrected body, never again an ache and a pain, never again an injury or an illness or a disease, never again. We're going to have power to go from one place to another in that split second of time as he did. We're going to be able to go through the walls like he did. We're going to be able to go from one place to another as he did. And so, all the scripture tells us, in fact, I'm just trying to think where it is. I think it's in 2 Corinthians, isn't it? Let's go back and look. 2 Corinthians, I think chapter 12. I hope it is, otherwise I'm out of luck. Oh, I guess maybe I'm out of luck. I'm looking for the verse where it says, For I hath not seen, nor ear heard. 
what God hath prepared for them that love him. And I thought, sure, he was here in chapter 12, but I'm not seeing it. But uh, anyway, you all know the verse, don't you? I hath not seen, nor ear heard. Now, what does that tell you? There is nothing in any of our earthly experiences that can even come close to that which God is preparing for us. And again, I know I've had men who just love to fish. They, they, they just think that that's the epitome of living. And they'll say, well, what greater thing can there be than, than fishing? And I say, now look, when you get to eternity, I don't know what it's going to be, but God has something in store for you that's going to make your fishing experience pale in insignificance. In the same way with anything else that we may think is, is great in this life, once we get into the realm of glory, what God has prepared for us is going to be so much greater, so much greater, that it's beyond human comprehension. And this is what we have to get excited about. We're not just going to die and go to heaven and uh, what will be will be. No, God wants us to get a glimpse of glory. He wants us to get a glimpse of what it's going to be like to be in his presence forever and ever. All right, coming back to Ephesians chapter 1. If you find it, why tell me and we'll look it up at break time and maybe I can put it into the next half hour. But Ephesians chapter 1 again and dropping into verse 19. As he continues his prayer, not only does he want us to understand the inheritance that's waiting for us, but we're to understand what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who have done all these things that denominations are demanding? No, oh, not in there. It's not, oh, you ought to hear some of the things that come over our telephone. Well, someone says I have to do this. Someone else says I have to do that. Someone told me I have to do this. I said, forget it. Forget it. There's only one requirement, and that is faith and believing. Now, it has to be genuine, not just a mental ascent. But over and over, oh, I could show you how many verses, that it's all based on our believing the gospel, plus nothing. You know, we've got buttons. Some of you are still wearing them. And uh, had quite an experience with it when we were in Israel. You know, it just happened, a lady from Tennessee sent us a package of them, and Iris just stuck them in her purse. And when we got to Israel, come to find out, we had the same number of buttons that we had people in our tour group. So she handed one out to everybody, and they all wore them, and I'll never forget my own experience. We were coming out of Jordan, and we were going through the uh, passport clearance, and of course, lines lined up. And a gentleman in another line, probably 15, 20 feet over, was looking and looking, and finally he couldn't take it anymore, and he walked over and looked at my button, and he said, faith plus nothing. Now, he was a Middle Easterner, I'm sure, but he talked perfect English. He said, faith? plus nothing? That's salvation? That's, that's right. And he thought for a minute. In other words, he said, it's not all of this work, work, work that my religion teaches? I said, no. Huh. And he went back and got in line. <laughs> well, you know, we had that experience all over Israel. Somebody would see one of our people and come up and say, faith plus nothing equals salvation? Never heard of such a thing. Well, it's a good conversation opener anyway, but that's where it's at. Faith plus nothing, but it has to be in the right thing. It has to be in that finished work of the cross. You can't put your faith in Paul. You don't put your faith in Peter. You put your faith in that work of the cross. When Christ said, it is finished. How in the world can people then say, but you have to do this and you have to do that? Then he lied. If he said it was finished and it wasn't, he lied. Amen. But he did not lie. He did finish it. And that's all he's asking us to do is to believe it with all our heart. And then let these other things follow. That's all well and good, but don't try to tie it to salvation. Well, anyway, the working of his mighty power to us who believe. Then verse 20, all of which all of which, everything, he wrought in Christ, not only when he died on that Roman cross, 
but it was epitomized, it was crescendoed when? When he raised him from the dead. See, and you don't hear that much anymore, do you? You don't hear much about resurrection power. But listen, that's where it's at. Had Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, had he not been raised from the dead, we'd be as lost as dogs. I mean, we wouldn't have any hope at all. But he was raised from the dead. In fact, let's go back to Romans. Romans chapter 1, I think it's verse 4. Romans 1. Verse 4, but in order to, again, I don't want to jump on that one verse. Let's go back up to verse 1. we got time enough. Romans 1, verse 1, Paul. Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Which gospel, that's what's implied here, which gospel he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. But now look at verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with what power? According to the Spirit of holiness. By what event? The resurrection from the dead. Had he not been resurrected, there had been no power. Had he not been resurrected, we would yet be in our sin. Satan would yet be in total control. Death would still be an absolute. But since he did resurrect, since he was raised from the dead, now we know Satan is defeated, we know death is defeated, and we know that we have an eternity where he is alive forever, evermore. All right all because of the power that was manifested in his resurrection. Now then, what does Paul also teach? That as Christ was resurrected from his earthly tomb, we have been resurrected from our deadness in trespasses and sins. And we're going to come to that now, not probably in this 30 minutes yet, but in chapter 2, see? And what has happened? Well, let's just look at it here in chapter 2, verse 1. And you... Still talking to believers. And you, he has quickened, or what? Made alive. You, he has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Well, what kind of power did it take to make us alive from being dead? Resurrection power. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. Romans 8. Like I said, this is Bible study. We're, we're not here to preach at you. We're just here to show you what the Bible says. Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8, verse 11. My, how these all fit together. I guess we should read verse 10, shouldn't we? And if Christ be in you, that is in the person of the Holy Spirit, as we saw in our last program. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. In other words, we were born in sin and we're sons of Adam. But the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, it's capitalized as it should be, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now verse 11, but if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. See how plain that is? The same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if he's indwelling you, Paul says, then he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or bring alive your mortal bodies by his spirit, Holy Spirit, that dwelleth in you. Is it all ringing true? Oh, I hope so. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the mark. It's the ownership of God. It's also that power that raised us out of our lost condition and gave us life. It's that same power that's literally going to propel us on up until we meet the Lord in the air. And it's that power of the Holy Spirit that guides us and directs us every moment of our ex existence. That's why I don't have to have, thou shalt not. 
and thou shalt, because we have the Holy Spirit that does that. Now, I, I've never run across a true believer who says, oh, I can go ahead and steal from my neighbor, doesn't bother me a bit. Can you imagine a believer saying something like that? No, because if he would, I'd have to say, I don't think you're a believer, because the Holy Spirit would never give you that kind of freedom. The Holy Spirit absolutely forbids those kind of activities. The Holy Spirit forbids adultery. The Holy Spirit forbids coveting. The Holy Spirit forbids bad-mouthing people. And when we're under His control, it's going to affect us. All right, back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. All of this power was wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. Now, I have to stop a minute again. In order for God to raise Christ from the dead, what powers did he have to overcome? Satanic, didn't he? He had to defeat Satan on his own ground. And all the powers of Satan and hell itself had to be overcome in order for Christ to be raised from the dead. Because that's the last thing Satan wanted. You know, if Satan could have kept Christ in the grave, he would have finally gotten what he wanted, that is, to be God. But Satan couldn't hold a candle to it because all the power of heaven was released when God raised him from the dead. And he didn't just raise him from the dead to go on from there, but then what did he do? He set him at his own right hand, where? In the heavenlies, see? For us, for us, he's not the king sitting on the throne of David on Mount Zion. He will be for Israel yet someday. But for us, he ascended back to glory, sat down, figuratively speaking, at the right hand of the Father to become now the head of the body, which is you and I, the church here on earth. And so I've said it over and over. He's not the king of the church. He's the head of the body. And we have that union that Israel knew nothing of. We have a union that no one in antiquity knew anything of. But it is unique to the church age believer that as we live and move on this planet, we are connected to our head who is in heaven. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.